Okay, welcome, welcome. Thank you guys so much for being here. We want to go ahead and get started because I feel like we're going to use up every every moment that we have. Uh, we, when we started our collaboration, we wanted to give you guys an assortment of activities that you could take back and maybe use next week or the week after. So all of the things that you're going to see here are very practical. They're also based on uh, good teaching theory using Bloom's uh, taxonomy. How many of you, you felt like you had some training in teaching before you became a professor? And, and so some of you did, and some of you were just thrown in, and here's, here's, here's teaching, go at it. And so uh, we're going to do a little bit of a reminder of Bloom's taxonomy. Which one? Just press the button. The middle? Okay, awesome. Uh, go left to right. Ah. Uh. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself really quickly and my colleagues will introduce themselves and we will have questions. We'll have questions towards the end and we will be using the handout. Um, there are a few left, but I think that, that most of them have been given out. So if you missed that, if you'll look on with a partner, that would be great. We're going to go ahead and introduce ourselves. I'm Tony McMillan. I teach English. I'm at the McKinney campus. I've been here almost 10 years. So it's been really exciting. Um, and I've been working with these folks, and I'm going to let them self-introduce. OK. So I'm Monica Coverly, also at McKinney. I teach history. I've um, been an adjunct since like 2001, um, but now I'm full-time like year two. So. Woo-hoo. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Megan Hoff. I am also at McKinney. I'm uh, in my second year of teaching English at Collin College. My name is Luis Gonzalez. I'm an adjunct in teaching history um, here uh, almost a year now, but I have like 20 years experience as teaching in high school and middle school. Awesome, awesome. Well, I ran into these folks in the hallway one day and we were talking about the upcoming conference and we're really excited about formative assessment, quick assessments that we can do in our classrooms. And uh, of course, we talk about when we run into each other cross disciplinary wise, we talk about things that we do differently. But one of the concepts that we try to keep consistent is we try to actually uh, measure our students' learning. And so formative assessment can help us do that. It's used by, uh, by you guys, of course, during the process of a project, uh, a lesson, or a unit. And so it's really good to start off with. Well, what's the first question we have about what our students know? The facts. <laughs> the facts. What do the students know? What facts do they know? So we have to kind of start off with that very thought of what do our students know. And so uh, then we can kind of go on and move from there on. If we do our formative assessments well, we can also teach our students how to assess their own learning processes. How am I doing in this classroom? How can I carry this skill of understanding my own learning processes forward into other classrooms? So uh, if we're using formative assessment correctly, we will have some low stakes assignments that help students gauge early on, am I on the right path? It also helps us to gauge, are our students on the right path? And it also helps us, and more importantly, I think, for us to gauge, are we on the right path, right? Because sometimes our students come to us with, see, um, who's a math professor? Uh, so sometimes students come with you with oodles of math knowledge, right? And sometimes they come to you with... No, I don't get those students. <laughs> awesome, yeah, yeah. So sometimes we have to assess what do they already know before we can launch into a certain particular lesson. And so we always want to start with, you know, what do they know um, as we begin to proceed any task. So uh, as deemed necessary, our assessments can be low stakes or high stakes. But using low stakes ones, like the ones, some of the ones we're going to show you, will help you throughout the process. So first of all, I wanted to kind of reiterate that, that good teaching is uh, something that we work at, and it is something that we strive for. Uh, Bloom's Taxonomy, they recreated Bloom's Taxonomy, if it's been a while since you had those teacher classes. And you'll notice that it has different levels of assessment, different levels of understanding. How do you get the most out of your in-class assessments? How do you get the most out? I want you to think about these questions 
as we move through today. How do you get the most out of your in-class assessments? What are the lowest levels of learning? What is the highest level of learning? Uh, just really quickly, which, which one of these levels would you uh, think in terms of remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create? Which one do you think is the most, the lowest level? Remember, being able to regurgitate the facts, the data, the information, and so on. As we go up the Bloom's taxonomy, we get a little bit more complicated to where they not only know the information, but they're actually able to apply, to analyze, to evaluate, and to create information. So based on the new revision of Bloom's taxonomy, which levels would you hope to see uh, discussed in today's presentation? Think in terms, what would you hope to see? Well, those same expectations are the expectations that we have for our classroom. We want our students to, we want them to have that base knowledge, right? What is a logical fallacy in English? Um, what is a particular incident in a historical event, right? We want them to have that. But we also want them to reach other levels. So measurement of progress includes action verbs. And it's really good to have a conversation with your students about these verbs as well as they can appear in their answers and responses to us. So assignments that measure progress should include words that help to assess levels of learning. Well, notice here that we have that Bloom's taxonomy. It's just represented in a different way. So we have knowledge, understanding, applying, analyze, evaluate, and create. So again, which ones here are the highest level? the last three. Now all of these others are important. We don't want to underestimate the importance of having knowledge, the importance of understanding, the importance of application. All of those levels need to be present. So for example, the attached table illustrates these action words that we can now take and use in our classroom. Most of you are already using them, but it's really great to go back to them and see which ones apply to what we do to each new assignment. So we want to see levels, varying levels hit as we move through. So one of the activities that I like to do is a very simple KWL activity, and many of you already do this one. You may not call it a KWL activity. What you know, what do the students want to know, and what have you learned? So we start with what do they know? So really quickly, you have a handout, and I want you to take one minute to write down some of the things that you already know about formative assessment. Okay, and once you have a, one or two ideas written down there, I would like for you to go ahead and say, what do I want to know more of in relation to formative assessment? And if we don't answer those questions during your presentation, we'll try to get to those afterwards. So what information do I need to know more about formative assessment? And then at the end of the presentation, we'll come back to what we have learned together. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about a history assignment that I use. Um, social annotation, which you probably already heard about. There is, uh, like, Perusal is one of those, like, off uh, Canvas sites that you can use. I was looking for a way to do this where I didn't have to go sign in somewhere else. So what I realized is I could take an article and I could copy and paste it into a Google Doc and then use a Google Doc, uh, set it up so that the students could comment to each other and then comment back to each other. And so that's the way I've been pursuing social annotation. Um, I do this in my in-person classes. I also do it in my online classes as well. 
Um, and I have Canvas um, just divide students up into groups. Um, and then I'm going to be addressing the groups at their little spots, their own little sites there within Canvas. Um, what I have found in doing this is you have to be really, really specific with the directions. If you tell them, just go, socially annotate, they'll be like, okay, well, I put one comment. Seriously, how is that helpful? Um, or you'll say, well, I want you to do five comments on this article. Well, you're going to see all five on the first page. Like, well, that's not helpful either. You're not getting everything I want you to get. So I set up my directions so that they have a specific number of comments that they're going to have to make original to themselves. And then I tell them, and you need to have X number for each page. So that, again, I'm making sure they're seeing the whole article. Then I also give them a specific number of uh, re-commenting. Like, go to your, your peers and comment on theirs as well so you can see interaction. And what I find is that students like this. Uh, a lot of them will talk about, gosh, I would have never thought about this the way this other person did. Or I wouldn't have um, given, I wouldn't have processed this in this way had I not done this. And they will actually go back and they will like comment to a comment to a comment to a comment. So you'll see a trail of the comments all the way through. So this works out really, really nicely. Um, this could be something that you do to maybe have, we've talked about a general, you know, American Revolution and here is one specific battle kind of thing. So it could go, let me check to see how did this one battle move the American Revolution forward or it could be introducing a new concept and then addressing it in a different way. All right, so again with those directions, you got to be very, very specific with that. Um, the downside to using a Google Doc is grading can be a little bit clunky in that you're going to have to go to each document and you're going to have to read all the comments yourself. Now you can pull it so that you're just seeing the comments and watching the flow and you don't have to look at the whole document, but there isn't a way to actually assess the comments within the document. You can go back as the instructor go, wow, hey Joe Bob, you did a great job here and Susie Q, I love this comment that you made back and it really pushed it farther forward. Um, and you need to also be very clear on the kind of comments that you want because you'll end up with, oh wow, this is really cool. Well, there's a whole lot of thought. Thank you for that. Um, so I go in here and I want you to, you know, give me, look for similarities, look for differences, look for reasons why these changes took place. Um, all of that needs to be there. You also need to be very specific. What I find as well is a lot of these poor students, they will come at this going, okay, well, I made my comments three days ago and still nobody else is commenting. Oh my God, what happened? So I end up setting up staggered due dates. Uh, your original comments are going to be due on one day and then two days later you'll have your annotations that are, you know, your, your comments back. That way it gives everybody a chance to have a lot of comments to look at. It's not just Joe, Bob, and Susie Q doing the whole thing themselves and then never seeing anything that Davy Ray wrote. Kind of an idea. Okay? Um, and then I usually have an individual debriefing that's going to go with it. So they have this group part that they do. And then at the end, I have them do a two-part debriefing. The first part is going to be, what did you learn from the article? Something to go with that. And then the second part is, how did this style of learning impact your personal gaining, your personal knowledge from this assignment? So they have to do that little metacognitive part with it as well, which they usually miss. So put that in big letters. All right, so then here's my rubric that I go with it. Um, I borrowed this from somewhere many years ago, and I honestly wish I could remember where I borrowed it. Um, but this is really awesome, the way it's kind of set up. And I put this with the directions, so they know this is what I'm looking for, folks. This, make sure that you're, you're hitting all of the parts here. There's a lot. We'll have a QR code at the end so you can get to this presentation later. Okay? All right. So, um, for your Google document, you have to make sure your settings are um, right for the assignment. So, you would go up to that little share spot, your pull down, you want to make sure that if anybody on the internet with this link can comment. Don't let them edit, you'll lose parts of your document. Uh, the comment is just going to set it up so they can see the document. Yeah, we don't need them to edit things. I don't need to see things that aren't supposed to be there, please. Um, so this way they're just going to comment. And this is the kind of thing that if you had somebody look at your paper, you sent them and then you just let them, it's the same kind of idea. But they'll see all the comments. All right, then when I deliver the link to them, I, each, each group will have their own document to work on so that it doesn't become cumbersome. I've set it up with about five people per, per document. Kind of a nice round number. Um, and I'll go to each page, each little group spot within Canvas, 
and then I'll give them an announcement with the link to the file, and then that's how they'll access it. All right, so, ladies and gentlemen, you are going to practice this skill. So what we're gonna be doing here, I have QR codes, I'm gonna divide you guys up into groups, just randomly. We'll pull it up really quickly. Please, everybody, don't be on the first page. Make sure you go into the second page or the third page. Um, it's just a little ar article about courtship practices in the 1700s, 17, 1800s, because it's interesting and it's fun. Um, what I'd like for you to do is go on and practice the commenting, okay? So, this is what your document is going to look like. And I'll come back to the QR codes in a minute. This is what it'll look like in order for you to comment. Let me get my glasses here so I can see where I'm commenting. Um, you're going to go to, it's not suggesting, oh, actually, you just go into the document here and you'll see this little plus. Click on the plus. And we can put it here, Megan is awesome. Mm -hmm. And I would never get points for this because first off, I can't spell and second off. That's not a thinking <laughs> comment. So um, that you go. Now I could go to Megan's here and I could say, okay, I want to uh, comment on here, which I think, yeah, double click. And then you comment here. Thank you. And hit reply, hit the reply button. And that's how we're going to go back and forth. Now. Normally, this would come in with, um, I would remind the students, hey, if you're coming in as anonymous, make sure I know who you are, because you're not going to get credit if I don't see your name in here somewhere. So you might have to remind them of that. Okay? So let me go back to this. All right. So let's go with, like, these three tables. Y'all can go be one. And then these two tables, you can be two, kind of here in the front two. These two tables, you can be three. And then you back sitting folks and that last table, um, y'all could be four. So you should be able to just zoom in on the QR code. Fingers crossed. little quick technology lesson for those of you who've never done this before. Were you not eating out during COVID? Is that what happened here? Okay. All right. That's how all the menus came during COVID.
so maybe it's not a phone thing. Okay, so maybe the phone isn't the greatest way of addressing the document, sadly. It does work really, really nicely on computers. Um, and the good part about using a Google Doc is it's still something that even if, if students don't have a word processing program on their computer, they can just log into Office 365 through Canvas, and this is still a document that they can access. Yeah? Well, good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Luis Gonzalez. I'm teaching History 1301. Thank you. And 1302. And this is going to be part of the History 1302 United States History, second part. Okay, so we have many complaints in, in class, especially the first day, about lecture classes and how boring could be a lecture class. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. You, you laugh, but yes, it's, it happens all the time. So today we're going to start doing an activity in class. So this activity partners is a single event in history using a primary source of record of the event with a companion play or work of art. That this, this big event, the event unfolding, students are given a suggested set of proposed verbs, compare, contrast, examine, describe, etc. That support discussion of the event in terms of varying the levels of information from basic summary to analysis or comparison of the two texts. In this time, we're going to use two different texts, and we're going to try to do an activity and trying to catch the attention of the students in our classes. Probably that's going to be uh, the big challenge that we have every year, yes, to catch their attention for the whole semester. In this case, we're going to do a reenactment exercise in history using the Buffalo Bill and the Boring King. So how many of you know that novel? No one? Not, not even one? OK, Buffalo Bill it was part of our, our culture, Western culture, for many years, especially here in, in the west side of the, of the nation, California, Texas, New Mexico, all that. It was, I mean, it was uh, the, the big um, blockbuster uh, of the moment. So, and, and we're going to do this exercise, and we, the student is going to perform in History 1302, and the purpose of the exercise is to compare the primary source documents with the theatrical representation of the U.S. historical characters. In my case, when I was doing my uh, PhD, I focused part of my, my investigation in the history of the theater here in America. So, when I found this, this one, I say, oh, this is probably could be a primary source. We, we are not used to use uh, novels or script or things like that like a primary source, but in this case, it's probably is, is one. So the document to use for the presentation that I said early uh, is the novel Buffalo Bill, The Border King by Colonel Preston Ingraham. Also, the student's going to um, read in advance that um, academic um, Lecture or academic, um, um, sorry. Uh, the how the West would place the influence of Wild West shows on American identity and perception of the genders in 1870 to 1820s by Justin Macaulay in, in order to discuss both, both, both documents. So in this case, this was the academic article, and that academic article is completely different to the other ones. Trying to understand one another but basis in the genders. So this is going to be a, a new challenge because, you know, in the Western culture, gender was very important. Men, women, and also other kind of genders. So the group will split into groups of four members two weeks before the representation. So imagine we are now in History 1302, you are students, so all of you are going to be part of my, my class right now, and you're going to split in, in different groups. Another complaint that we, we hear very often is about the students that they are, uh, have any communications with the other students, right? 
probably because they are new there, they don't have any friends or um, any uh, other people who, who used to, to speak with. So in this case, now we're going to split the, these groups in, in four members and they have to rehearse. Okay? And also, we're going to discuss chapter 17 in the text of the American Yacht. So the instructions, basic instructions. Every group will choose one scene of the novel to reenact uh, in class in front of the peers. So they're going to read the whole novel. It's, it's not a big one. It's not a big deal, okay? Uh, it has just like 600 pages. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no, okay? It's just less than 100 pages, okay? So they're going to read the whole novel, novel and they're going to choose one scene, the favorite one, okay? I don't want to put anyone in a box or in a cage, so they have the freedom to choose the scene they want to represent or act, okay? So the scenes needs two different types of characters, good and bad guys, okay? Important, yep, because in our history and the history of the humankind, we have good and bad guys. Costumes are, are a plus. It's not necessarily, it's not going to be part of the evaluation, but if you're doing, it's going to be better. So the scenes will not last more than three minutes, okay? If you choose something that's going to be last more than three minutes, it's okay. Three minutes to four minutes, okay? So students do not turn, turn in anything in class or canvas at this point. So according with the Bloom Taxonomy steps, we're going to, in that pyramid, we're going to start analyzing, evaluating, and creating. One of the most important things here is trying to develop the creativity of the students here in class. So the tax, each group will discuss the critical analysis of the exercise and compare contrast you're seeing with the provide article. So what are we going to do? We're going to do the rehearsals, the students, and the band's going to rehearse, and then in class, they're going to do the act. They're going to stage their scenes. So what are we going to do after that? Contrast the representation of the Native Americans in the novel with the per per perspective of the article. They also, they're going to examine the Americans' perception of genders in the article with the perception of the genders in the novel. Two different kinds, completely different, okay? In fact, just to spoil this, in the novels, you're not going to find not too many women in there, okay? Why? You can explain that. It's going to be part of your, your task. So compare the Native Americans' behavior at the time of the Indian Removal Act in the 1830s. What was happening there? Probably all of you know about that moment in history, yes? In the act, okay. So what happened with those Native Americans back then, and we're gonna compare with the Western Native Americans. Differences we have, we don't have, okay? And describe the theatrical representation of William F. Cody, the original Buffalo Bill, okay? Because the original Buffalo Bill, it was theatrical representation. It was like a circus. It's like the rodeos now. You know the rodeo? Someone here have been in the rodeo before? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, someone can explain me how is that? How is that? How is uh, the rodeo? It hurts. Yeah. It's what? Okay, what else? Berry, yeah? Okay, and also you can find in some rodeos, uh, um, they're playing like Indians and versus Cowboys. Who always winning? Why? Okay, but that's the true? No. Why not? Someone say no. What? What else? Something else? Someone else? Okay, so we're going to discuss all that there, 
and they have to represent that there on stage here in front of their peers. So part of the rubric, very simple. We're going to use what? The Bloom Taxonomy Levels, yes? Okay, so we're going to um, evaluate about creativity, the valuation of the scene, and also how to analyze the scene. Okay? And they're going to answer some questions after their, pres their presentation. And this is going to be all the questions they're going to they can answer, and they're going to add thoughts, opinions, what do they think about what's really happening there. Just comparing two different sources. Okay? And this is probably the biggest challenge that we have because you know, our students always have the same, the same complaint about all the time we're doing the same thing, the same thing, the same thing, and we're going to do something in front of, of, their, of our peers. Yeah? To maybe some of them have different talents. Not, not everyone have the same talent. So some of them like to, to show themselves to others and represent. Okay? Thank you very much. quick activity that takes very little preparation and you could try it tomorrow if you wanted but you wouldn't have any students to try it on but uh, I was trying to think uh, when Tony asked me this I was like what do I do to check students comprehension and I think this kind of falls into it it's called the muddiest point activity um, so have you ever ended a lesson by going great any questions <laughs> what do you usually hear <laughs> crickets so the muddiest point activity, the goal is to flip that on the side, not ask students what they understood, but rather what they didn't understand, right? Um, so you might, have to, you might have to explain what it means for something to be clear as mud. Um, but basically, what of everything we talked about in this, in this lecture did you understand the least? And let's go back to that, right? So it's basically an informal assessment that gives you just a quick view of what your students understood and more importantly, what they may have misunderstood or didn't grasp at all. Um, and they're easy and quick, uh, so you can, you can really do them throughout the semester. How to use it? Well, decide what you want to look at. Uh, do you have a lecture that seems particularly hard, a reading assignment that students struggle with? Uh, maybe it's a concept or a unit. Um, you can pretty much do it on anything. You just have to be clear about what you're talking about, right? Um, you can make a canvas survey, you can hand out note cards, pieces of paper, have them pull out paper. You really don't have to prep anything if you don't want to. And just ask them, what was the muddiest point? Or what did you find least clear? Right? Um, and then there's, that's pretty much the activity. That's it. You're done. Um, what do you do after that? Uh, one variation that I really like is to have students look through them and sort them, basically by question, concern. Um, similar ideas, and you can go back and address them yourselves, or you can ask your students to pick one and to go clarify it for the class, right? Um, so asking students to go back, look through the class resources, maybe do some research online, and clarify that muddy point for their classmates. Um, so I tried to think of an example. Um, here's a quick one. This is, a, this is a section of a reading that I usually have my students read. I ask them what makes a student successful, and I present this model. So take a minute and kind of skim through it. I know we're short on time, uh, but see if you can find a point where it gets muddy. In addition, I mean addition. There's a lot of in additions, yeah. So the writing itself gets very muddy. I love giving them an academic, like a purely academic text, and asking them to do something with it. For the most part, my students will come in the next day and I'll say, have you read? And everyone will say, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'll be like, great, uh, what did you guys learn from it? Or I'll ask them a direct question and I'll be like, I don't know if you didn't read or if you just didn't understand what you read, right? So asking them to really focus on leaning into where they don't understand, ask them to do something a little more complicated than just read, right? Um, so what I might do is go, well, did anyone get stuck at the word self-regulation? Right? That's something we can look up, right? Um, can anyone tell me what an emergent model means? 
Most of the time, no, but they won't tell me that, right? Um, let's look that up, right? Or um, what do we mean by environmental factors, direct control, generate awareness, right? So we can, we can kind of dig into places where I expect they'll get stuck, right? And as they go through the semester, they'll learn how to do this themselves. Why use this? Well, it helps you address misunderstandings before the high stakes assessment, right? Um, it, you can do it anonymously so that students don't have to admit they don't understand something, right? They might give more honest feedback. Uh, it's a very clear, you're showing that you care about their learning, right? Um, and you're teaching them metacognition, which research has shown over and over again that, that really helps students succeed in college. You're teaching them to be the, the managers of their own learning. Right? by identifying when they haven't learned something that maybe they think they should have. And it helps you figure out what you might need to go back and look at and re rework in your lessons. Um, you can use this at any time, uh, just basically just making sure that students understood the skill, the assignment, the unit that uh, you, you've recently done. Um, my favorite time to use this, as you saw, is for the reading, right? So asking students maybe some pointed questions, but when they come in from the next lesson, I'll ask them to go ahead and brainstorm some of the muddiest points, and that's where we can start our discussion. Right? Um, I had a friend who got through grad school by reading one page of every reading assignment, because <laughs> you can always comment on that one page in class. Right? Um, so this, again, this is a little more complicated than asking them to talk about something, but to ask them to really think about where did you get stuck and why. Let's lean into it. Um, so it asks them to do something a little more complex with the test. Or you can use it at the end of the class. Instead of that classic exit ticket where you ask them to answer a question, ask them to write down what was the muddiest point of the lesson, and then it gives you a bridge into the next lesson. You can start there and go into the content. Um, so it's a really, it's a fun, little, easy activity to do. Um, and I'm gonna pass that on to Tony. Just getting ahead of myself. Okay, so we wanna return to the what I learned activity because this is, this was what we started with. Um, you know, what did you already know? What did you want to know more about? And what have you learned? So just take uh, two, two minutes to write down maybe what you've learned or which activity you think you could try. Uh, but moreover, I want to know what types of quick activities do you do in your classroom already? So we're going to share those in just a moment. So take a moment to write them down. And then I want you to pair up with someone right with you. Uh, lean over and talk to someone. If you're at a table with two and three, then pair up in threes and twos. So two minutes on the clock. Take a picture of me standing here with the group. Yeah. 
It does. It really does. Now two now two minutes is up, so do we let's see, I'm gonna cancel and um, they have they have a we have a we have a muddiest point to cover. I'm gonna go ahead and hear a few of their ideas too, so Okay, time's up. Time's up. Go back to that taxonomy slide. We can. Can we do it right at the? We're going to have Whatever. questions. We're going to go. We're going to do muddiest point. I'm going to let you be the first person asking. Okay. No, asking You're going muddiest, to ask the muddiest, the muddiest point. point. Yes, on the muddiest point, you want to look at that again. Okay. You're going to be the first one up. Okay. So we want to go ahead, and I want to hear from some of you. And I love that you guys are engaged. This is perfect. I love it. Yes. Okay. You want to have a flashlight? We have about eight more minutes, and we want to hear your ideas. So finish the idea you're on, and then come back. Good job. Okay, so we do want to hear a little bit from you guys. We don't have time to hear from all of you. We know you have fabulous ideas and fabulous activities that you do all the time with your classes, so we appreciate you being patient with us and only having a few minutes of time. Um, if I could have one table on the left side of the room volunteer. Yes. So mine is completely different than everybody else's because I'm workforce, so I do surgical assisting. And um, we have little areas, so we'll do uh, five questions, we'll pair up three or four students. They have to answer those questions correctly before they can sew whatever activity they need to do. Um, once they finish that section, they, they move to the next section and they have to answer four or five more questions as a group. And even if they get it wrong, they come back to one of us, uh, see if they have it right. If they have it wrong, they have to go back before they can start their um, you know, uh, physical assessment of sewing or whatever they're supposed to be doing. And what I have learned that even if they get it wrong, they, that communication and, you know, kind of arguing back and forth of, no, I think it's supposed to be this because of yada, 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 they get that understanding and later come back, oh, I remembered it because the way you explained it to me worked out well. Right. I love that. Immediate feedback. You're analyzing right there on the spot. You're critiquing right there on the spot, and they can take that feedback and apply it. Okay, someone in the middle here, please. Someone from the middle of the room. One activity that you do in your classroom. One of the things that we talk about over here is, is evolving, moving towards the flipped classroom where you, know, you have them do a pre-reading. They come in, and many students that are recent high school graduates do not necessarily understand what they don't understand at the muddiest point. Um, and so that really falls to us to encourage them to identify, do I really know what that term means or what that phrase means? Um, we were talking about how to do like a um, some sort of an assessment. I use the Krebs cycle because that's what I did with my high school freshmen for, for decades. Is that I would have them pre basically pre learn the Krebs cycle, come in, and then they would be with a group and they would have to try to draw it from memory every single time they failed because they didn't assess, they didn't look at it ahead of time like they were supposed to. I would give them another chance, but then it became a high stake point value for this is your assessment, you get one more opportunity to do this. They would then pair up with someone that they knew was going to have a good memory recall on that, and I would let them choose that team. Gallery walks are an awesome way to do it. Partnering with somebody that knows more than I do, it's an excellent <laughs> idea. It's the way I, it's how I survived graduate school. Teaching them strategies, I love it. And someone from the right side of the room. You had a great one. Okay. I'm so sorry to say Okay, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I was telling them, I'm an English teacher, and my kids spend a lot of time, uh, and I teach dual credit high school, so they spend a lot of time writing, uh, 
and they don't like to spend a lot of time writing. So <laughs> I try to do all my formative assessments in some other format. One of my favorites is having them do teaching videos. So this is, of course, at the end of whatever I have done in the classroom, as well as other types of exercises and things. So, and usually if we do a teaching video, it's of one simple concept. Like if they're doing logical fallacies, for example, they get to explain one logical fallacy, and they have to give an example of that logical fallacy. Um, and they're much younger than me. They know all kinds of stuff on the internet that they can make these videos out of, and I don't even know half of those tools. <laughs> so, you know, cartoon things and graphic things and, you know. And then we post them, you know, as teaching resources um, so that other students can access them. So they have someone other than me to explain that logical fallacy, and they have so many other examples that I wasn't able to come up with. So they, if my example didn't make sense to them, those will. My rubric is usually structured for Bloom's taxonomy, you know, for how to create the video. I also have samples from past semesters, so they get to see a sample video before they start. Mm -hmm. And these are very short, you know, like TikTok links or mm -hmm. Facebook links. Well, they don't use Facebook, that's for old people. <laughs> 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 Videos, but yeah, so. Um, it's something they really <laughs> enjoy. It's something, uh, my kids tell me it's for old people. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's something they really enjoy and something, and they can comment on each other's videos once we right. post them on Canvas and stuff, and that's really fun for them as well. I love how your, your project started with the base information, the factual information, then it built on them parsing out what it means to them, their own interpretations, putting it into their own language, then creating role playing even in a certain way and developing their own materials so that they can teach others. It's a fabulous process. Good job. Okay, so you guys are doing a great job of, of coming up with these and now I know I'm going to come to you guys for some more resources later on. We're gonna, I'm going to come to you. We do have a, a one last question for you and uh, uh, and uh, we only have a couple more minutes but does anyone have uh, any questions or does anyone want to return to something that was the muddiest point in today's presentation <laughs> <laughs> we have a hand right here can you just put the slide back up with the uh, uh, text on the, um, yeah. yeah absolutely uh, let's go back to the original it's bigger Sorry, I'm a little slow. Get next, get next. Get there we go. There it is. Yeah. There we go. Anyone, any else? Do you have a QR code to your whole? It's at the end. Yeah, it's right at the end. Oh, yeah, let's put that up. Yeah. Okay. Once everyone gets this chance. <laughs> You can probably exit out and go straight to it. All right. If you guys want the entire presentation, there's a QR code that links to it as well. Now that we've learned QR codes today in class. <laughs> Thank you.